You may be seated. Our scripture reading this morning comes from Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 7 through 14. It says, For thus says the Lord, Sing aloud with gladness for Jacob, and raise shouts for the chief of the nations. Proclaim, give praise, and say, Save, O Lord, your people, the remnant of Israel. See, I am going to bring them from the land of the north and gather them from the farthest parts of the earth, among them the blind and the lame, those with child and those in labor together. A great company they shall return here. With weeping they shall come, and with consolations I will lead them back. I will let them walk by brooks of water in a straight path in which they shall not stumble. For I have become a father to Israel, and Ephraim is my firstborn. Hear the word of the Lord, O nations, and declare it in the coastlands far away. Say, he who scattered Israel will gather him, and will keep him as a shepherd a flock. For the Lord has ransomed Jacob, and has redeemed him from hands too strong for him. They shall come and sing aloud on the height of Zion, and they shall be radiant over the goodness of the Lord, over the grain, the wine, and the oil, and over the young of the flock and the herd. Their life shall become like a watered garden, and they shall never languish again. Then shall the young women rejoice in the dance, and the young men and the old shall be merry. I will turn their mourning into joy. I will comfort them and give them gladness for sorrow. I will give the priests their fill of fatness, and my people shall be satisfied with my bounty, says the Lord. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable and pleasing in your sight, God, our rock and our redeemer. I pray that because of me, or even in spite of me, this morning your word would be faithfully proclaimed. Amen. So back when Abigail was still really little, um, we had the bright idea to go on a family trip up to the mountains. Um, we, I think Abigail was about two months old, and since we were still in the thickness of like October of 2020, we were still in like shelter-in-place restrictions of the pandemic. Um, so she hadn't really met many members of the extended family. Um, I think she had met my mom and dad, so her grandparents at this point, but she hadn't met my sister or her cousins or, um, I don't know, my, my grandparents, so her great-grandparents. Um, so to celebrate Shane and I's birthdays, which are both in October, and our wedding anniversary, was at, which is at the end of October, um, right before the end of my maternity leave as well, we planned a long weekend trip up to Asheville. Um, we rented a cabin from some family friends we have since I grew up in Asheville, and the cabin had room for basically the whole family, my sister, our nieces, my grandparents, my great aunt and uncle, my aunt and cousin, and both of my parents. So there were a lot of us in there. Um, and given that we still lived at the time in Gainesville, Florida, um, the trip to the cabin was about an eight hour drive, like roughly. Um, and looking back, even the thought of deciding to take an eight hour car trip with a two month old, seems like a terrible idea. Like it just seems like a recipe for disaster, um, especially given that this would have been our first real trip away from home with a newborn, which parents know is not always easy and you don't know what to bring and so you bring it all. Um, and I'll never forget that trip, um, probably because it, was, it felt like such a hot mess, especially like to and from. Um, when we left, we weren't able to leave until close to 7 p.m. because Shane was not on paternity leave yet. He was still pastoring at his church, and they had their annual church conference meeting that night, like at 6 p.m. or like 5.30. So we didn't get on the road until close to 7. Um, and then when we finally got on the road, we still hadn't eaten dinner, so we had to stop an hour into the drive and pick up Zaxby's through the drive through um, I think at that stop we had a diaper emergency, but luckily we got to take care of that. Um, I mainly remember that stop, though, because after we fixed the diaper emergency, we had to put her back in her car seat, um, and she was not happy. That led to a lot of hysterical crying. For quite a while, we were leaving Jacksonville, and we were worried that that was going to be the rest of our trip for the next seven hours. Um, luckily, 
she finally gave in and fell asleep. Um, but the other thing I remember after that little bump right at the beginning is when we finally got to Asheville to this cabin, it was like 4 or 4.30 in the morning. Um, but when we got there, not only were the porch lights left on for us since we were driving to a cabin in like the middle of kind of nowhere in Asheville, um, but my parents had also stayed up, or at least they had gotten back up to welcome us home. Um, even though I had told them they did not need to stay up until we made it, I kind of begged them not to because I knew we were going to get there at like 4 in the morning. It really did mean so much to us to be greeted by lights and smiling faces of people we love after a long and exhausting car ride. It was such a simple and small act, but having someone leave the lights on really does mean so much to make you feel welcomed when you come home from a journey or when you make it to your destination. And we've talked a lot about light and home throughout this Advent and Christmas season. But as we move towards the end of Christmas tide and into this new year, I wonder how we can take the light of home into the rest of our lives. How do we let this light shine in and through our lives wherever we go, not just at home? How do we take the light and hope and love and peace and joy that we find when we're at home and carry it with us out into the world wherever we go? And I think the biggest thing um, I believe we have to do is to realize that the light doesn't just exist outside of us. Sure, we do experience a lot of lights in this season. Um, the lights on our Christmas tree or our Chris Christmas trees at home, um, the lights on the candles of the Advent wreath, um, the lights of outdoor Christmas decorations, the lights on tents all around the campground, the lights of candles on Christmas Eve. The, there are all of these lights and even more that we experience and appreciate throughout Advent and Christmas alike. But the light of Christ doesn't just live and exist and shine outside of us. It also lives in us. The light of Christ isn't just out there. It's in here, in our hearts, knit into the very fabric and core of our being. And when we realize that the light of Christ shines not only out there in the world, but also in here, in our hearts, and through our lives, I think that has the potential, that realization has the potential to change everything. Because when we know that the light of Christ shines in and through us, we don't, we don't have to wait for Christmas to roll around each year to experience the joy and hope that we find in the birth and light of Christ. Jesus is the light that shines in the darkness. We hear that proclaimed every year. But that light isn't just limited to the stories we read and remember each year at Christmas. That light continues to shine forth. That light continues to shine and to provide us guidance and hope. The light of Christ shines in our world. It shines in our hearts. And if we follow as disciples of Christ, it can also shine in and through our lives. And the scripture reading I read this morning came from the book of Jeremiah. Um, we haven't heard from Jeremiah throughout Advent yet. It's mostly been Luke or Isaiah. But Jeremiah was one of the prophets that spoke to the Israelites in the years when they were living in exile. So they weren't living in Jerusalem, the land they knew and called home, but they had been taken into exile. Um, Jerah might have been a bullfrog and a very good friend of mine, but he was also a pretty dark and gloomy guy, at least the version of him that lives in the Bible. Um, the prophecies that he proclaimed, they were hard to hear. He often gets a reputation. People call him the weeping prophet. And he had a tough job. He was called to speak to God's people in the midst of huge disagreements when they were captors living in the land of their enemies. So Jeremiah was often speaking to a, to a group of people who had lost a sense of hope. During the, years of Isra during the years living in exile, the Israelites had really lost sight of who they were. They had lost sight of who they were as God's chosen people. So not only had they lost a sense of hope, 
They had lost a sense of identity. But our scripture passage, um, it reads a little bit differently. Our scripture passage came from Jeremiah 31, which is part of a four-chapter section of the whole book of Jeremiah that people call the Book of Consolations. So it's fitting that the words that Jeremiah shared in our passage were a message of hope and gladness. They were a part of this message of consolation to the Israelites. And our passage starts with Jeremiah saying that the nations would sing aloud and shout with gladness as they praise God for saving God's people. And Jeremiah speaks of how God will gather the remnant of his people bringing them back in from all of the ends of the earth. Though God's people might be weeping, Jeremiah tells us that God will console them and lead them to walk along brooks of water without stumbling. God will gather his people in like a shepherd gathers in his lost sheep. God will ransom and redeem the Israelites from the hands of their enemies. And as God does all of this, as God gathers his children back together, God's children will sing aloud and be radiant over all the goodness of the Lord. God's people will celebrate all that God has done for them, and they shall never languish again, Jeremiah tells us. He goes on to say that the young women will rejoice with dancing, and the young and old alike will be merry God will turn mourning into joy, will comfort them, and will trade their sorrow for gladness. And in all these things, Jeremiah says that God's people will be satisfied with the bounty of the Lord. And what strikes me about this passage from Jeremiah is how rich and abundant all of the imagery is. In this passage, Jeremiah was truly proclaiming a message of hope and gladness. And what's always astounding to remember is that he proclaimed this message of joy in the midst of sorrow. Like I said, he was talking to people who were still living in exile. They couldn't see a real sense of hope. But here he is singing about the joy that will be restored to God's people. He proclaims this joy in the midst of deep sorrow. But so often... That's when the sweetest joy comes, in the midst of sorrow. Sometimes the deepest laughter comes in the midst of tears. Sometimes the most transformative joy comes in the midst of brokenness and struggle. And I don't think that's any sort of coincidence or accident. I think it's intentional and just inherent. Because when we know deep sorrow and pain, when we know the pangs of grief and loss, when we know hunger or emptiness or want, when we know these kinds of deep struggles, we, we have a deeper and truer appreciation for the joys of life as well. Because when we know the realities of pain and loss, we don't take things for granted as easily. We hug our loved ones a little tighter We don't let conflicts go unresolved. We don't wait to tell people how much we love them. And there's a famous quote that gets attributed to Albert Einstein that says, there are only two ways in life, or there are only two ways to live your life. One is as though everything is a miracle. The other is if nothing is a miracle. And I love what this quote captures, and I'm convinced it's also a self-fulfilling prophecy. Perspective really is a powerful thing. If we choose to look at our world and focus on the pain and loss or brokenness of it, we will almost always find a lot of it. We will see unfairness, injustice, grief, and sorrow. But we can also choose to look at our world and to focus on the joy and light and hope that we find. And when we focus on that, when we focus on gratitude, and intentionally looking for seeds of hope and promise in our midst, I'm convinced we will almost always find them. So there are two very different ways we can look at the world as we live our lives. It's our own version of seeing either nothing as a miracle or everything as a miracle. 
And my hope and prayer as we start this new year is that we might choose to see everything in our lives as a miracle. Because in light of all that God has done, all that God is doing, and all that God will continue to do for us, it truly is a miracle. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.